This is the logo type lecture for the beginning typography class. And in this lecture, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of logo types and where the lineage of combining letter forms comes from. Then I'm going to show some examples and talk a little bit about how modifying and combining letter forms can be a great strategy and a useful approach for the combining letter forms assignment. Branding and typographic marks as we think of them today have been in use since the 18th and 19th centuries. However, symbols that represent people, places, or things have been in existence since the Middle Ages and really led to the development of modern-day branding and logos. So it wasn't really until the Industrial Revolution and the need to brand and sell products that we see branding and typographic marks in the way that we would think of them today, but there's always been these symbols that have represented people, places, and things. So this is an example of stonemason marks. This is in a church in the south of France, and these are from the 13th century. So these were people that spent an incredible amount of time doing the masonry work inside of this building. And so it's almost a signature at the base inside of the catacombs of the church where they made this inscription that helps people know who actually made this church. So this is really, in a lot of ways, a symbol in the same way that a logo is a symbol. This is really representing a person and allowing them to identify their work. We also saw these in pottery. These are examples of potter's marks from Northern Europe. So these were examples of marks that would be inscribed or pressed into pottery that would allow people to identify who exactly had made or produced that specific piece of pottery. And here's an example of a more modern day rendition of a potter's mark. These still exist today. And to be honest, this is very much what you will be doing on the combining letter forms assignment, finding ways to interlock the anatomy and create something that's of interest. We also saw these things with royalty. A lot of kings and queens had these typographic marks, and these frequently featured letter forms as well. The one on the left is from Charlemagne, and they were these seals and almost crest-like solutions that really demanded authority and gave them this royal decree. These things were often used to seal letters or denote royal communication or correspondence, so they really represented the the reign of that royal figure. There are other kinds of marks too. In the upper left we see a crest for Martin Luther. He was the one of the central figures of the Protestant Reformation. So we see that M and L with that flower locked inside of that circle. There were also family crests or crests for cities. The lower left is the crest, the city of Bath in England. And so that's really denoting a lot of symbolism and showing you these different components that are important to the history and the story of Bath. And then we see other royal symbols or family symbols and crests that become important. People that, you know, want to represent their family or their lineage with certain symbols. We see this also in Japan. These are family crests from Japan. They're very different. They're more geometric. They're more simplified, but they really function in the same way. These would represent specific families, and so we're seeing a plethora of them here. Here's a door where you're seeing them applied in metal and how they might have actually been used, but very graphic in quality, but same idea, these representations. Although these maybe look more like modern-day logos because they're so simple and graphic, they really serve the same purpose as a lot of the family crests we've seen up to this point. We've also seen some logos previously in this lecture. This one on the left is from Aldous Minutius, one of the first and earliest logos that we have an example of somebody using a symbol to represent themselves. So it's this fish interlocking on this anchor. Or on the right, Albrecht Durer, famous artist, you see this symbol he's created out of this A and D, which is a very old symbol, but in a lot of ways something that we would again do today. So then we had the Industrial Revolution, and we see the need again to sell goods, to create products, to create brands, and to create experiences for people. People start shopping and trusting specific brands, creating relationships with companies, and there's a need for symbols to represent those experiences and those companies. So here's a nice progression of the Prudential logo. It's a very early logo. Their logo is a symbol of the Rock of Gibraltar. So that's what you're seeing here. And if you start in the upper left and move left to right and then down, you'll see that there's this steady evolution and this overall simplification of this form, especially in that bottom row. You'll see how the last two become so much more graphic. There's really a 
drastic refinement to how this thing is built and drawn because you know the field of graphic design evolves and our expectations of what these symbols need to do evolves as well so although we're not looking at typography or logo types these things still apply and I think seeing this gradual simplification of these symbols is valuable to understand the evolution of how logos are really made. They started very ornate, there's very tiny type in a lot of the early ones and that's eventually dropped because those things don't work at small sizes. And then eventually that rock symbol is made more powerful and shape-based so that it becomes a stronger mark that can be used in more variety of places. Here's the pelican logo. This is an interesting one because it really starts with the family's crest. The pelican was featured inside of it and then really became a symbol that was pulled out and used for this company. And pelican is a company that sells inks and calligraphy materials. So that's really something that they have attributed. The pelican doesn't traditionally really have anything to do with that industry, but by using their family symbol and through an incredible amount of time, they've begun to associate these two things. And here on the left, you can see again how that family crest evolved and was simplified into this one pelican feeding these baby pelicans. And you can see how that all the way to the last one from 1937 really features this very graphic approach. We're seeing again, like the Prudential logo, this very simplified graphic solution. And then the right, the typography. So that's really evolved over time as well, keeping the essence and the historical quality of what the type was from the beginning, but then simplifying it to making it more usable and readable for today, all the way down there at the bottom in 2003. So I think these things are interesting to see how these logos evolve and how our industry has really evolved in our expectations of what logos need to be and how they need to perform. This is one of the earliest logos for Bass Brewing. It's the first logo that had any kind of protection on it and was trademarked in the UK. This signature solution with this red triangle, those are both protected assets for the Bass brand. So logo types are a specific form of logo and they create a visualization of the name of a company or organization. They have advantages because they are distinctive and readable, making them easy to market and identify. So because they are readable and you can read what the text says and the text is stylized in a special way that hopefully tells you a little bit more about the industry or makes it special and unique, logo types are very powerful solutions for graphic designers and one that we use fairly frequently. Here's the Coca-Cola logo type. This is one of the most famous and identifiable logos in the world. And it's really based on Spencerian calligraphy. It was designed with the creation of the product. It was originally done by, I believe, the accountant or somebody who worked with the man who invented the recipe for Coca-Cola. But since it's been refined, it's gone through revisions and it's really helped that Coca-Cola has stuck with this logo and that's what makes it such an identifiable symbol. This logo type and its unique qualities has really driven the brand and given it a lot of equity and power. The Disney logo is another great example. A lot of times, Logo types are based on some kind of handwriting or signature, and this is a perfect example. The Disney logo is ultimately based on Walt Disney's signature, and they really captured that quality. Obviously, it's been refined over the years, and there's been a lot of revisions that have been made, but they've really kept the essence of his signature and the quality of it in this very iconic D that is really a big part of the Disney brand, an important part of the assets that really drive commerce and decision-making and the love of Disney. IBM, Paul Rand's work. This is not necessarily calligraphy based. Here we're seeing slab serif typography, but with a brilliant treatment of these line work that runs through the IBM M that gives it this technical edge. It's a wonderful logo type that's still in use today and a brilliant solution. Here's FedEx, another very popular logo type, one that a lot of us really enjoy from a graphic design perspective because of the hidden arrow in the negative space. A lot of us remember the first time that we realized that the arrow was in there and it's such a witty, clever solution because that arrow really denotes moving forward and the progress of moving things, which is really what FedEx does and it's the core of their identity and it's really actually inside of their identity, which is a really special solution. This was done by Landor and Associates in San Francisco. ExxonMobil, another very old, old brand, but a really wonderful solution from a logo perspective. It's a logo type, but here we have this double X monogram right after the E, and X's are tricky characters to put together. If you think about them, they create this diamond of white space between them because there's a lot of space that intersects in the X. And so by creating a ligature here and combining those two X's together, not only are they creating something that's really unique, 
but they're solving a typographic problem that would exist if these x's were actually just standard, non-modified, and next to each other. Oftentimes when logotypes are very successful, they inject some meaning, or there's something special about what they're doing. Like the upper left, this B, it's for a market that specializes in olive oil. And they have this wonderful olive that's hidden inside the counter of the bottom part of the B. Or this Slice, this is a company that makes cutting products, so the actual logo is sliced. Or some other wonderful solutions, like the Victoria and Albert Museum on the upper right, this is one where they've modified the ampersand and gotten rid of the left side of the A and then doubled up that tall serif on the ampersand to become the crossbar of the A to make it readable as a V and an A. So a really brilliant solution, although maybe it doesn't shed as much light or information on what this museum does. It's a really wonderful modified typographic solution. Down at the bottom we have where the C for criterion is actually becoming a container and then the type is actually placed inside of it. So another interesting solution where type is being used as a, as a vessel or a shape that's going to contain the overall name of the company. So again, typographic solutions are something we see all the time. They're very valuable and they're a really great tool in graphic design and typography. Monograms are a specific kind of typographic mark where two or more letter forms are combined and often woven to create a single mark. So this is really a specific kind of mark that we see. It's used very often. It is sometimes frequently associated with fashion brands or more luxe-oriented brands. But here we have a monogram that was done by Muka Design in New York City for Victoria's Secret. So you can see how that V and S are woven together, creates this symbol, becomes image in the way that those combine together. Or more ornately with this WBG monogram in the lower left, so there's flourish typography here, it's combined in a symmetrical way where they're balancing that B and the G on either side of each other. So one of the keys oftentimes of creating monograms is how do you prioritize the right letter forms, so making sure that things read in the correct order. And then how do you create symmetry and balance? Because oftentimes these are very complicated and they rely on a little bit of balance to make them work. And then last here on the right is the Tiffany & Company logo, a brilliant redo of this monogram by Luis Fili in New York City. There's a wonderful attention to the balance of this mark in the way that the T runs through that ampersand in a very symmetrical way. And then the way that the C and the O are balanced on either side. There's also a nice addition of these white lines that help you see how the letters weave around each other. So it looks like at the top of the ampersand it weaves behind the T, where in the middle part it comes on top. And that's a wonderful illusion that's been created that helps it feel as if these things are woven together. This was an interesting process as well because this monogram needed to work at such a small size that it could actually be pounded into jewelry. So there was a lot of testing that went into this to make sure that this symbol would work at very, very small sizes. Here's some other typographic monograms that we're looking at that were created mostly by people in Great Britain. So we'll see these different tactics of the way that they're combining these letter forms together. And these are really real world solutions of what you'll be doing on the combining letter forms assignment. So the way this S and N comes together on the left, or the N and T for national theater in second from the left, or interesting solution on the far right where we're looking at some positive negative space. But one thing that's really important for us to pursue this is an understanding of gestalt theory, because that's really what's being used in a lot of these solutions. And this is something that's covered in our basic graphic design class, but I think I want to cover some of it again here as well, because gestalt theory is the concept that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And gestalt is a concept from psychology where theorists note the propensity of humans to conceptually group things together to make a meaningful whole. So it's really the way our brain works in a lot of ways. It's the way we absorb and look at information. It's assumptions that our brain is going to make about what's happening when we look at visuals. And it's important to understand this because you can leverage this and utilize it in your design work to create even more powerful solutions. So here's a little diagram that explains what's going on with Gestalt, because it really breaks down into some basic concepts for the most part. So the first one on the left is the concept of closure, and that's this idea that our brain connects the G together at the top and the bottom even though it's broken. So part of that is that it's close enough together that we can make that connection. If it was too far apart, we might not be able to, but our brain can see that happening. We can see that closure and combine that together. The next one is proximity. And that's basically the idea that things that are closer together, we're going to assume go together. 
If things are further apart from each other, we're going to assume that they don't go together, that they're actually not related to each other. So that's an important concept to understand. So our brain has a tendency to assume that things that are closer together are related to each other. Then the concept of continuation. And that's really the concept, it's similar to closure, in that as we look at this S, there's a white band behind it. We assume that that white band is one solid piece. It's like one solid white rod. Although we can't see it when it weaves behind the top and the bottom of the S, we still assume that it's one piece. We're not assuming that it's actually broken behind those and there's a hidden broken piece or that it's actually made up of three separate bars and we can't see those separations. Our brain assumes that that's one piece that continues. So then up at the top with these two T's, we have similarity. Similarity is similar to proximity, but it's more that if things look similar, like these two T's are being treated in the same way, we assume that those things go together. We assume that those things are related. Our brain makes a connection to the styling of these two T's and says, oh, look, those are the same. They must be related to each other. And then figure ground, which is something we looked at in the FedEx logo. That's really a figure ground solution where that arrow is hidden in the negative space of the letter forms. Or here, where there's a tree that's hidden within this A or an upward arrow, depending on how you look at it. But by removing that crossbar, they were able to create a figure ground relationship where there's actually a symbol hidden inside the negative space of the typography. So if we look back at these examples, we can start seeing how these gestalt principles are used. On the left, where they're using closure and similarity, the similarity is coming from the line work all being the same weight. The closure is coming from us connecting the middle part to understand that there's an S there, even though it's actually not connected, and so on and so forth. So in the National Theater, you'll see closure again because of the way that the N and the T are connecting together. There's also similarity because the N and the T are the same style of letter form which helps us understand that those are the same. And then there's the proximity of the way that the serif on the left side of the T is so close to that downward stroke of the N, which helps us double up and see that that shape is being used more than once. Or in the CS solution, where we have continuation, at the top we continue that C and allow it to share that top of the S. Similarity, again, because the styling of these letter forms is the same, which helps us know that they go together and are related. And proximity as well, because the distance or the space between the C and the S is close enough for us to make those continuations, but it's also far enough apart that we can tell there's separation. And then this last solution that really relies on figure ground, this wonderful figure ground relationship where the T is really the negative space and the B, but then also continuation because we can't see all of the boundaries of that T. We can't see the top of it or even some of the bottom left part of the stem, but we still can identify it as a T. We're able to see it and know that that's what it is. So these might potentially be principles and theories that you wanna think about as you're exploring finding solutions on your own letter forms. So here's some others where we're playing with positive negative space. This T and G on the left, or this R and B on the right where they connect together. And these are examples of the combining letter forms assignments that we've had. And you're really going to work with your initials. So that can be your first and last name, or you can explore your first, middle, and last. So we want at least two, and you can go up to four. Some of you may have a hyphen last name or two last names, and you're welcome to include both of those. But only use them if it makes it easier for you. Well, I also want to make sure that you're working with at least your first name and your first last initial. I think those are the most important. But part of the challenge of this too is prioritizing the letter forms. We talked about this, but we want to make sure that your first name reads before your last name. We want to make sure that things are reading in the correct order and have the correct hierarchy. Here's some other examples playing with positive negative space, some brilliant solutions. Although the one on the left is using a nine, so obviously that's not quite appropriate for this. The others fit with that K and R, or the S and Q, or this R and I. So playing with positive negative space can be a really good solution on this. It can be really interesting. But you can also just look at the anatomy of these letter forms and how they fit together. Sometimes that's a really great place to start. Thinking about what is common in these letter forms. Are there shapes that are repeated or anatomical pieces and structures that can be used more than once or combined together in some interesting way? So I always think that's one of the best ways to go on this assignment. And it's not that this assignment isn't real world either. 
a lot of the best brands and biggest brands in this country and the world utilize the same solution. These monograms, these combined letter forms like Louis Vuitton or DC or the New York Yankees, you know, these are all examples of combining letter forms. It's also important to be aware of these because something like the Chanel C's, we want to avoid that solution. It's going to be really hard to interlock C's in that way without it feeling like Chanel. So it's interesting to know that this is something that you potentially will use in the real world. But again, it's also important to be aware of these real world solutions so we avoid them. So this assignment will really allow you to explore how to approach creating typographic marks as well as how to refine your ideas. You'll also learn more about the logo creation process that will help you in much of the professional work you will do as a graphic designer. A large amount of our work is creating logos in some kind of mark. And there's a very clear process that we go through to build those marks. Because we have to do them so frequently, it's important that we have a defined process that helps us find solutions, or else it would be really difficult to do this work on a regular basis. So this is really the first step for you, and that's why we're asking you to do a certain number of sketches and go through the process of refining and defining the direction of your work because that's really what you will do in the real world. So remember, you might want to look at some of the typefaces that you will work with. You can work with any of the ones that have been shown so far in this lecture, but it might be good to print those out so you actually are looking at the form and structures of those letter forms and not maybe creating solutions that would be difficult to create in the computer with the typefaces that you're allowed to use.